topic that everybody should listen to because it affects all of our lives moving from nuclear technologies to these breakthrough energy technologies. So the 2013 Global Breakthrough Energy Movement brings you Mr. James Schmidt. Thank you. And thank all of you out there, wherever you are. <laughs> uh, my name is uh, James Schmidt, and I'm a retired aerospace engineer uh, who had the opportunity to be in the military. And I uh, was a, became a nuclear weapons effects expert. Uh, not hireable these days. <laughs> uh, and in that profession, I, I, in, I worked for the, for the Air Force for about seven years, and then I went into the, uh, uh, into the uh, you know, the business side of it. So I worked with Northrop Grumman and uh, TRW back in those days and as an engineer and as a manager, mostly in a technical sense, project manager, and uh, later on was into uh, line management uh, with that company. And, and our whole purpose was to uh, maintain the, the uh, ballistic missile systems that are, are stationed up in the northern states here. And so I'm very familiar with how uh, nuclear weapons work. And when, you, when you're involved in understanding how nuclear weapons work and the effects of nuclear weapons, there's a whole slew of physics that is associated uh, with nuclear weapons. And so... Uh, I have a whole range of science and physics and chemistry that I've become acquainted with. And that was just fine with me because I like to learn about everything and be able to understand everything. And this is what, from the beginning uh, in early age, I had an interest in Tesla and uh, fringe science. And so this science also enabled me to understand free energy and how the, the different types of free energy technologies work. And I've done my own experimentation, uh, in, including doing some transmutation work with uh, electrolysis. So I'm on both sides of the, of the aisle here in terms of, uh, of science. What I'm going to do today uh, is uh, I'm going to talk about nuclear power and the evils of the nuclear power and how we need to change that and get in transition into breakthrough energies very soon. And I'm going to talk about uh, I'm going to talk about uh, the methodologies for neutralizing uh, nuclear fallout. I'm going to talk about alternatives to nuclear power, uh, and what what is the transition that we need? We can't just overnight transition. Can't just overnight cut the grid out there. We need to uh, have some transition, and that's going to be basically the renewable energies that you're looking at right now. Uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about what, what's going to be the impact of uh, breakthrough energies on people's individual lives. It's going to be, have a huge impact, and that's why we need to be going in that direction also. And then what is kind of a process? I like processes. I'm an organizer, a, a visionary, and planning kind of guy. And so, you know, what is the process by which we uh, are going to get there? I work for, uh, I have worked with a group called New Energy Systems Trust. We're an incubator. Uh, where we're trying to network uh, inventors, free energy and inventors with uh, professionals and manufacturers and those who might be have the vision to invest in, uh, in free energy. Nuclear power, uh, what is it? How is it produced? Uh, it's basically taking uh, uranium manum and, and splitting it in two, and in the process you create uh, uh, some new extra neutrons, which... Uh, uh, fission other uranium atoms and create heat in the process. And that heat is uh, used to boil water and that, uh, that steam is then used to drive the turbine and then you create your electricity. Uh, unfortunately, there's some uh, nasty stuff going inside the, the reactor here. And it's basically a controlled bomb. That's all this is, a controlled bomb. Uh, the way you, you uh, control it is you put carbon rods down into the, in along, in the middle of all these uh, uranium rods, and you capture some of the neutrons and click and control the fission process, 
And when that gets out of control, then you have real trouble. That's when you have your meltdowns. There's a lot of radiation associated with this. And we're going to get into that. We're going to get into the, you know, do, what do you do with the waste that comes out of here? What do you do with the have a catastrophe? And we'll talk about Fukushima too. Here's a Fukushima uh, power plant. Uh, this was before uh, BF, before Fukushima. <laughs> uh, here's a, uh, a chart of how nuclear power is kind of split out around the world, how it's, how it's used. Uh, there is a whole list. I don't have the whole list of uh, countries here, but I just wanted to pick up the ones that are uh, significant. There's four countries that have that uh, more than uh, a billion kilowatt hours per year. Uh, United States uses the most nuclear power, but it only is, it supplies only 20% of our electrical energy. Uh, Russia only 17%, but has 165. France is overboard there with 75%. Uh, of their energy come from nuclear power with 404 uh, billion kilowatt hours. Uh, surprisingly, uh, uh, the Republic of Korea, uh, South Korea, uses 30% uh, for nu from nuclear power and 143 uh, billion kilowatt hours from that source. Here's a map of the U.S. nuclear power plants, uh, just to give you an idea how they're distributed, mostly on the East Coast. Location of these uh, power plants is uh, critical from the standpoint of uh, you want it in a place where it's not going to, if something happens catastrophically, uh, you want it in a place where it's not going to affect too much. So you wouldn't expect a lot, you expect more of these plants to be out in the West. The problem is you need a lot of uh, cooling water to cool these things. Millions of gallons a day has to be cycled to there. And so you have to have a place where you can have a lot of cooling water. That's why you have them along the, uh, the seaboards. The fission products that you produce in a, in a nuclear uh, reactor uh, come from the fact that you're splitting a uranium atom uh, and you, you produce a, a kind of a double hump of atomic numbers. Fission products come out of this. And it turns out there's hundreds of products uh, that come out, isotopes they call them, uh, which are just different numbers of neutrons with protons in, in those different atoms. And they have what they call half-lives. That is, uh, they're unstable isotopes, and they will decay uh, with time and into a stabilized isotope. And some of them, it takes have very long lifetimes, very, some very short. In this case, because there's hundreds of them, some of them start to have a millisecond lifetime, and so they stabilize very quickly into something that, that's stable. Here's just, a, uh, just to give you an idea of the, uh, uh, there's a big long list and on the left hand side here is the, uh, the yields that come out of there start, and on the right side is the half-life. And in this case, I just started with the uh, iodine, which is at eight days, has a lifetime of eight days. So it, it's fairly short lived, but you know, just after an event and you're close to it, iodine becomes important issue and you have something like uh, down here, another iodine 129, palladium 6.5 million years, and uh, iodine 129 is 15.7 million years. In between here, you have uh, cesium, which is uh, 30.17 years. That's important because it gets into your food chain. Uh, so it's, it's around a long time. This chart looks uh, same chart, but on the left-hand side, we view them in order of yield. And so the bottom is the most yield and the, and, the, and the least yield up on top. And I've highlighted in yellow here, uh, those isotopes that uh, are important in terms of our health and the effects of, on life. And so that's why I've highlighted those in yellow. Uh, get, into our, get into our food sources and, and uh, the air and, and so forth. The, the primary ones are iodine, cesium, and, and strontium. And early on in the, in the air, you'll get uh, xenon, but xenon stays in the air. The others will, uh, will uh, uh, deposit themselves in the ground or the water. And so that's why we're concerned about those. 
And when we talk about radioactivity, what, what are we talking about? Well, we're talking about particles that are given off from these atoms uh, that uh, can penetrate us and cause health problems. Well, there's three types of particles. Uh, there's the alpha particle. That is a basically a helium uh, atom. Uh, the, the, uh, the center of the helium atom. And because it's so heavy, it's easy to, to uh, shield out. And you can use a piece of paper and use clothing. We'll, we'll shield that out. You just don't want to breathe it in. That's all. Uh, the beta is just basically an electron. It can go through paper, uh, through your clothes. You need kind of some kind of a light uh, metal uh, to stop it, like aluminum. And then you have the gamma rays, uh, which penetrate just about anything. Lead's about the only thing that will, will shield the gamma rays. And that's what a lot of the uh, detectors uh, measure as gamma rays. One of the, one of the issues with uh, radiation is uh, how do you measure it? I mean, how do you know you got too much and so you need to measure it? And uh, one of the things that the system has done, uh, the scientists and the government, they've come up with these units that nobody can understand. Anybody know what a becquerel is? A sievert? Uh, these, these familiar terms to you guys? <laughs> That's, that's what they have done to us. Uh, very difficult. So I'm going to try and, uh, and go through that. Uh, think of read. So you have the source. Radioactivity is the amount released at the source. Exposure uh, is the amount of radiation that, that you expose to. So uh, in fallout, you know, they call it you know, exposure per meter, per area. And, uh, and then the absorbed dose. How much are you absorbing? I mean, most of we... We don't worry about the outside, but what you breathe in or eat. And then there's the dose equivalent. That is, once you absorb it, what is the, the radiation equivalent normalized uh, effects? And we call that uh, uh, dose equivalent, uh, the REM, uh, radiation equivalent in man. That's what the REM stands for. So you start to understand it a little bit. RADS is typically what we talk about uh, in, in measuring counts per minute. So you can understand counts per minute. A Geiger counter puts out counts per minute. Uh, and I'll give you an equivalency there. Here's some numbers down here. Uh, a Curie uh, representing something at the source is 37 uh, times 10 to the night, the Curies, but you don't care about those large numbers. It, it, you need to understand how, the, how much is going to affect you. So that's what I'm going to try to explain here a little bit. Here's some radiation threshold levels. Average human uh, receives an exposure of about 600 millirads uh, per year. Uh, so that's just normal ground radiation from the, from the atmosphere and so forth. Uh, one, one in 1,000 cancer risk starts at about 1,200 milliads, millirads absorbed. And the onset of radiation sickness is about 75 rads. And uh, what I learned is a... A young guy uh, learning about radiation effects is about 100 rads is uh, absorbed radiation is about where you start to see people getting sick. Uh, the onset of radiation poisoning, where you get you start to have to uh, take them to the hospital, uh, 300 rads. And a, a key one that uh, the media likes to use, 50% death rate in the population from cancer and various uh, poisoning uh, occurs at 400 rads. And, but all this is somewhat complex because it's dependent, not only dependent on, on the total dose that you've got, but how much you get, the rate at which you get it, and over how much time you get it. So it, there's different effects if you get 100 rads over 30 days and you get 100 rads over a year. But in all cases, they're accumulative but we have an immune system that is, that is really pretty fantastic. And it can deal with this, uh, the radiation effects in the cells uh, and take away some, the antioxidants and the disease cells from the radiation uh, if, you, if you're healthy and, and uh, eating correctly and there's certain things you can take uh, to deal with this. So it's, it's, a, it's a complex kind of issue. But you get overwhelmed with it, uh, you just, your immune system cannot deal with it. Radiation, uh, high radiation dose, dose rates will kill cells. 
uh, low radiation rates can alter the DNA. And so in, in, in young children uh, and in unborn children, you can get these defects. Uh, cellular damage, uh, as I mentioned, depends on dose rate, the accumulation dose, and the duration of exposure. Uh, a dose of 100 rims in a few days would show some kind of symptoms. I'm going to talk about uh, Fukushima, uh, and I'm, but I'm going to talk about it in terms of the United States. Uh, what has been the effect here in the United States? That's what we're interested in. There's a lot of people reporting on what's going on in, uh, in Japan. Uh, a lady, Helen Caldicott, down in Australia has done a great job in, in trying to educate the Japanese to what's going on in their own country up there. Uh, we have no reporting from the NRC, the EPA, the FDA on what is the fallout is here, what effects have already occurred here, and I'll get into that just in a little bit. Uh, we do have a, some civilian radiation monitoring system that monitors uh, radiation in, in this country, and, and people can go online and, and re report what they have uh, got in their uh, recorders. And uh, so here's a, uh, a map, and that is uh, radiationnetwork.com you can go to. And you can join up and report your own, uh, own readings on that. These will turn red if they get over uh, 100 counts per minute. So, and 100 counts per minute is about two milligrams of radiation per day. So then you can determine, well, how much have I accumulated over five days a week and, and, and so on and so forth. So that, that kind of is a key number for you, just gets you in a ballpark of how much radiation that uh, you might have received. Uh, some other interesting facts about the fallout from Fukushima. Uh, around the planet itself, uh, a lady named uh, Janet Sherman, Dr. Janet Sherman did some studies and she uh, estimates there will be about a 50% of the next generation in Japan will receive cancer. Uh, and that may go up from what's going on over there now. Radioactivity is now uh, is increasing. It's entering the groundwater. There's a big plume coming out from Japan and heading toward our west coast. Uh, some say it's already here. And so now you're worried about the fish that you're going to be eating out of the ocean and absorbing the radiation from the fallout and that. Uh, mm -hmm. The radioactive uh, cooling water, they're having to put more cooling water in through the damaged uh, facilities there, and that is flowing out in, into the ocean. Uh, so that will continue for a long time. There's, there's no way, real way of fixing that. They're talking about ways, but it's going to be a long time. Uh, it's been estimated that uh, 8,000 picocuries of, per kilogram of cesium has been found in Northwest, which is about, this is over 10,000 times. Or, uh, higher than what they have uh, recorded in the past. Uh, and I-31, uh, iodine-131, is 100 times of, of normal up in that area. Uh, Dr. Uh, Sherman has done some studies up in that area, and she found that year over year, there was 14,000 additional deaths uh, up in the uh, northwest, and it came mostly from uh, pneumonia, and, uh, and thyroid-related uh, diseases. And uh, nobody re reported any of that. That just come from her study, but that wasn't reported out in the open. Uh, and she projects that they're over time, and it's mostly young children, uh, and they were mostly susceptible in their lungs. Uh, and she projects, you know, over time, uh, you know, 10, 50 years, uh, there are going to be millions of deaths across the United States, and you won't be, they're just so subtle in, in the form of cancer and other increased health diseases, uh, you, won't, you won't know this, you won't see it. There'll just be increased death rates. Nuclear, other nuclear plant failures that you're uh, pretty much aware with, uh, uh, the Chernobyl uh, catastrophe, and that's still putting out radiation across the uh, Europe over there. The Three Mile Island, 
uh, and Fukushima. That's putting out right now the equivalent of 10 uh, nuclear Hiroshima bombs per hour. And then they don't tell you about the leaking uh, uh, nuclear plants that we have here in the United States, uh, up in Washington, and that the California Santa Onofre plants has had problems. I just heard uh, this afternoon somebody was, was telling me that uh, um, shortly after Fukushima, uh, the Santa Onofre plant developed cracks in it. And there's a theory that uh, skater weapons were actually used uh, to create the uh, tsunami in Japan to cause, ca cause that uh, failure over there in Fukushima. And the cracks that we saw in Santa Onofre may have been a, a revenge attack from someplace else. So there's all these other theories going on out there, but it, it's, some of it may be real. Uh, we have different uh, risks that go on uh, with, these, with these plants across the United States. I'll get to that. Other, other uh, emergency shutdowns, mostly due to, to weather over time, uh, that have occurred to uh, plants uh, across the United States. And then we have nuclear waste uh, that we have to worry about. So, so what if we don't have a, a catastrophe? We still have to get uh, rid of the nuclear waste. And it's always uh, not my backyard, you don't. And so we, and this is accumulating over time. I say, oh, we have all these solutions, and, uh, but it's still piling up. Uh, and what do we do with it? Poisoning the earth. Here's a, an example of a storage waste in Russia, a salt mine. They just drop it down in a salt mine. There's a, a lot of, uh, some of the countries are actually dropping their nuclear waste in the ocean. They just go out and, and dump, it in the, dump it in the ocean and deep trenches, supposedly, but uh, still over time, uh, it's affecting the earth and the interior. And I look at the, the earth as a living system. And... It, just like our own body. And so when you poison it, uh, bad effects are going to happen over time. So the continued risk with nuclear power plants are going to be with uh, the natural disasters, the, the earthquakes, the tsunamis, the floods, uh, and the loss of cooling water. And then they have to go to an emergency mode and they can hold the, hope they control the reaction uh, and not get a meltdown. My understanding in Fukushima, they do now are now melting down, melting through. That's the underground reports. And so it's getting into the groundwater uh, over there in Japan. And then, and then there's just the people problems. You've got all the manufacturing problems. You've got the politics. You've got the man management processes that you have to go through. And, uh, you know, people are, people are just human, and, and they make mistakes, and uh, we don't design infallible devices. Uh, I'm a scientist. I'm a, I have a physics degree. I'm an engineer. And, and I've always believed that you can engineer science and use science to solve any problem and engineer anything. And I recently did some studies in the, in the fracking area. And while I still believe you can do fracking safely, when you get the human element involved uh, to, you know, to save on money and, uh, and, take care of the politics. It's just a dangerous situation. It, it just doesn't work. And, and over time, uh, these plants are going to age and you're going to have to replace them. Uh, so we're talking about replacing, we're talking about increasing the number of plants. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, the, the risk of uh, using nuclear power are just far too great to continue going in that direction. Uh, the risk of one catastrophic failure to me is not worth all the electrical power generated around the world. It is just not worth it. Uh, I, I'm reading a book called Infinite Energy Technologies, uh, and it has a foreword uh, by uh, Paul Hawken, and he, he brings out the concept of uh, spaceship Earth. And so if, if you built yourself a spaceship and you wanted to travel for uh, 300 years, how would you build that spaceship? How would you feed yourself? How would you uh, recycle all the waste that you created so that you're gonna, and your next generations arrive there healthy? We need to think of our spaceship Earth in that manner. And 
nuclear power, nuclear power plants is not the way I would design our spaceship Earth. Radioactivity uh, that we're putting out through Chernobyl and, uh, and Fukushima is going to last hundreds and thousands of years. In the meantime, there are long-term solutions. Uh, uh, there's breakthrough energy that we're going to talk about and that we replace nuclear power with. And with the problems that we now have with radioactivity, there are some solutions use, uh, using uh, remediative processes. And we're going to talk about that. So the solution to uh, cleaning up the nuclear poisoning of our planet is, uh, and I think edu starting off with educating our uh, uh, citizens about the poisoning, the cover-up that's going on in our governments. We need to contact our legislature to make sure we don't build any new ones. Uh, we need to start decommissioning uh, the plants. We need to get rid of the aging leakers first. And then we need to talk about doing some research into neutralization of our radioactive fallouts, wherever that may occur, and, uh, and do some mitigation uh, and also do spend some money on research in this area of mitigation and neutralization. And then we need to get, uh, get beyond that and start looking at the promising new breakthrough energy technology and get them online as soon as possible, bring down the grid so we don't even have to have a grid. Uh, we'll talk about the new breakthrough energy technologies also. There are uh, some proven, already proven uh, mitigation technologies uh, based on both mainstream and some breakthrough uh, technologies. Uh, and I've divided them between uh, three areas. One is high temperature plasmas, uh, low nuclear uh, reactions, and electromagnetically generated skater waves. All three of these areas have uh, demonstrated that you can uh, mitigate and neutralize radioactivity, uh, which we are not looking at or doing at this point in time. Uh, just to go through a, a few of these uh, technologies, uh, you know, this is mainly from a report by uh, Mike Peringa from uh, the uh, from PACE, uh, Planetary Association for Clean Energy, uh, some time back. Uh, Brown's gas uh, has a unique property; it, it creates a plasma in an environment. Uh, it will reduce uh, radioactivity by 90%. I've read those reports before. Photo deactivation, uh, where you use a, an electron beam uh, directly onto a tungsten target, and then that re-radiates uh, radioactive waste and, and, re and reduces the radioactivity that way. There's a zip fission and fusion process where uh, you uh, submit the, the rad waste into a, uh, 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 a carbon arc underwater, and uh, I have a friend who worked, worked with that and actually saw that demonstrated. Uh, there's bionuclear uh, uh, remediation. Uh, it's amazing what uh, our, our bodies, the, the biological processes can do uh, to clean up our bodies. Uh, there's the Monte process, uh, in, which is confined explosions. And then there's the... Uh, uh, Tom Bearden approach of uh, using non-Hertzian waves, which is just basically scalar waves, uh, use them in an interferometric process uh, to uh, transmute the, uh, the radiation and, and also uh, reduce it. Uh, and other, there's, there's also, we've, we've seen uh, Ken Rolla uh, here at the conference. He's building these scalar disks, they're passive disks that uh, put out scalar waves and that would be expected to uh, neutralize uh, radioactivity in addition to dealing with chemtrails and other poisonous uh, substances in the, in the, in the atmosphere. Uh, and the, the thing I like about Ken Rolla's uh, technologies is that uh, it's, it's open source. Anybody can make these. You can put them out in your backyard, spread them around, serpificially, serpificially, <laughs> uh, undercover. Uh, some, so... There's all these different technologies are available. We can put more money into it, do more research. It'd be nice if the government did that and helped us, but uh, we need to get together as citizens and start thinking of how we do that. There's some solutions already exist, and there's much more research to be done, but we can get started now. One of the things that uh, I'm thinking we, we ought to do is 
people, citizens ought to get together in their local communities and just talk about this. And you could uh, send somebody to your local uh, university. University of Denver has a, uh, a class for uh, a radiology expert. And you, so you can get educated on uh, uh, measuring radioactivity and the health effects of radio, uh, radioactive materials and learn how to measure the radioactivity fallout yourselves. Uh, so that's something that citizens can do. So what do we do uh, to uh, replace uh, nuclear power generations? Well, I think the transition is going on now. We talk, we're using renewable energy, sun, uh, wind, and uh, solar solutions, the geothermal. Uh, the other thing is we're also talking about clean fuels attempting to make go in that direction. I thought we'd have hydrogen by now, but we don't. Uh, Natural, uh, natural gas is, is pretty clean. I just found out that uh, up in Weld County here, one of the largest counties uh, in, in the world, uh, the ERA, uh, or the REA, uh, Rural Electric Association there, we have a lot of oil drilling going on in this, in this area. And so they have to uh, create energy to power uh, their drilling operations and uh, pump, pumping uh, operations. And so what they do is they take the natural gas that they capture right at the well and they, they put it through a, uh, a generator there used to power their generators. I found out they're generating three megawatts of, of power up these co-generators right there in, the, in Weld County. Uh, and so there you go without having to have all the, all the grid. Uh, we have uh, locally clean, other clean fuel, clean coal. Uh, you know, that's an oxymoron to some people, but uh, we have a, a company down here in South Den Denver, uh, Veritech Corporation, who is advertising clean coal. I, I visited them, and they actually have a process, a tabletop prototype process uh, that uses uh, some electronics and uh, some uh, uh, electromagnetic uh, waves uh, to uh, actually dissociate uh, dirty coal, get the individual elements out, and he comes up with blocks of clean carbon. And then you burn that carbon in a, in a plant, you get the CO2 out, and you take, use the same process to, to bring, uh, turn the carbon dioxide back into carbon and uh, oxygen. So, uh, rooting for him. Uh, and then we've had, you know, a lot of work being done on the uh, hydroxide technologies, uh, for the generation of hydrogen, and I'll talk about one of those in, in a minute. Um, but yeah, the new energy paradigm really needs to be the breakthrough energy technology, and our conference is demonstrating that, that there's just a tremendous amount of people out there uh, working on this, and practical devices come, and come to the forefront. Uh, and so I'm, I'm just going to kind of skim through uh, give you an idea of the magnitude of the work that's really going on in Breakthrough Energies. Uh, here's a number of different forms of energy and people working on, on uh, Breakthrough Energy. So you go from thermal energy, radiant energy, elastic energy, uh, luminous energy, all, all these different types of energies available to work on for, for free energy. What is free energy? Uh, that begs the question to most people who you know, free energy, what, you know, you can't make something out of nothing. Well, it really isn't free, of course. Uh, you have to work to get it out. But what, what do we mean by free energy? Uh, starting out, it describes it as the energy that is available from the universe for the taking at any time for any use. Uh, Peter Lindemann uses the definition of free energy is any energy uh, that is provided by the natural world. And uh, my own definition is uh, free energy is that free energy contained within the ether uh, that's between all of the space. Uh, that's what I call uh, the basic source of uh, free energy that's out there in the universe that we're not aware of. Um, solar, wind, gravity, these all too can be, be forms of uh, free energy, if you will. There's a long history of, of free energy research. Uh, 
in looking back into it myself, uh, Leonardo da Vinci is actually uh, the beginner of it all with his illustrations. There was always the, he had his drawings where he had the, uh, the water paddle and you see the water coming off the paddle and come back up the top and all around. His perpetual motion machine, that was the first free energy device from my perspective. Uh, there have been dozens of inventors since then uh, that have brought forth uh, uh, different ideas, working, working inventions uh, since then, including Nikola Tesla. We'll talk about that. Uh, there's thousands of breakthrough energy scientists and engineers uh, and even scientists in academia now uh, getting on the bandwagon. Uh, working on this on these devices, uh, the march toward uh, new energy society has been thwarted, however, by I think academia uh, and uh, not invented here syndrome, uh, and but we're 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 seeing a crack in the in the uh, in uh, you know we're seeing a crack there right now. Uh, so from my perspective, we're still in a flat Earth uh, kind of uh, science society, uh, but we're starting to get the word out there. Inventors of the past, uh, I just listed out a few of the, of the more famous one, uh, John uh, Worley Keeley. Uh, all of his science was based on harmonics, uh, and he, he demonstrated that it, in his devices that it isn't just a machine, the harmonies of the machine, but it it interact, can interact with the, uh, the operator also. And so intention becomes involved in a lot of these uh, free energy devices. And I think that's where you're able to control more how it's used. Victor Schwabarger is, is, uh, is famous for his studying water and, and the vortices and the natural uh, healing processes that water goes through, through vortices and the, and the action of the, of the water to going down the stream. And a lot of purification devices have come from his, uh, uh, his studies of, of water. Uh, Thomas Henry Murray is famous for his uh, 50 kilowatt uh, radiant energy device where he, he uh, uses wires to, to accumulate radiant energy and then light up uh, 50 kilowatts worth of, uh, uh, and it's based on his famous uh, Moray valve. But uh, he had a hard time convincing people that he wasn't using some kind of magic uh, for that. Uh, Nathan Stubblefield uh, built the first wireless telephone even before Tesla. Uh, a lot of battery, earth batteries he's famous for, a, 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 an area of interest that I have. Uh, Herman Plossen harvested energy from the, from the atmosphere, uh, actually uh, used it in, in some airplanes in some cases. And Lester Hendershot, uh, famous for his few less motor, it's believed that uh, he may have, uh, they may have uh, used his device uh, on the, uh, oh, what's his name? Uh, the guy that flew across the ocean the first time. Uh, yeah. Charles Lindbergh. Uh, the first guy that he hugged when he got off his plane when he landed in Europe was Hendershot. So some people believe that he actually, uh, that plane was actually flown by his, his motor. Uh, John Searle, uh, famous for his magnetic, uh, circ circulating magnetic motor. I just, uh, I finished a book last year uh, by John Violet and anti-gravity propulsion. Uh, and he really goes into detail on the, on the science of John Searle's uh, motor, very interesting. When he experimented that, he lost uh, many of those into space uh, and uh, now we've got other people experimenting with that motor, including uh, Jason Verbelli and, and uh, with a group down in San Diego. Bruce De Palma, uh, motor generator. Uh, Peter Lindemann uh, did a, uh, a, an excellent uh, talk on uh, how a, a motor and a generator works, and got an old textbook and demonstrated that uh, a, a motor and a generator should actually have a theoretical a coefficient of performance of two. And that's because when you pulse a coil, you get a back EMF out of that. And so when you, when you learn to control what's going on in the motor, you get what you put into it plus what come out the, 
come out the back. And so that, that's the basic principles of a lot of those motor uh, uh, generator type of uh, research, the Bedini motor, which I have built and, and experimented with. And uh, I've, got, I've had successful results uh, with that. Edwin Gray, um, don't know, I'm not that familiar with the capacitor discharge engine, which somewhat makes sense. Uh, Joseph Papp and, and uh, uh, John Roeder of Intelligentry has uh, uh, been experimenting with that. I'm not sure he totally understands that, but it's, uh, they're using a gas plasma and, and uh, trying to uh, generate energy in a, in a, in a, like a car engine. Well, of course, the hero and avant-garde of, of all the, the free energy movement is uh, Nikola Tesla, whose name is being taken out of the textbooks, and uh, so we're not able to appreciate what he really what he really did. Uh, he has more than over 600 patents that are related to electromagnetics, electrical devices, and it, it goes on and on. Uh, famous for his Tesla coil, which everybody is experimenting with, and he's he's more more well known out in the world for his uh, practical applications, the uh, AC motors uh, that drive all of our uh, industry uh, these days. And, and we wouldn't have the grid if it wasn't for Nikola Tesla because uh, he demonstrated that AC was the only way that you could propagate energy over long distances, uh, whereas Edison uh, with his DC could only propagate it over, over a few miles. Uh, why hasn't free energy come to the forefront? Uh, it's suppression, basically. Uh, Renzi.com, and I think Rex researchers, other sources, have uh, talked about different people uh, who have been killed because of uh, the work they've done in the free energy area. Uh, the, the one person that, uh, that uh, I sync with is uh, probably Eugene Maloff, who uh, was the editor of the... Uh, in, Infinite Energy Magazine, uh, who just happened to be bludgeoned to death in a supposed, uh, uh, you know, raid on his house. And uh, so the list goes on and on. Uh, so many of us are familiar with that. I haven't heard so many of that many uh, frequently. I think there's, we're overwhelming them with the numbers at this point in time, hopefully. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there's just hundreds and thousands of people who are working in their garage, uh, professional scientists, in engineers, just plain old people, uh, just fascinated with this, uh, this science and uh, are experimenting with them. At, uh, you can go to, go to uh, Rex Research and uh, get a whole list of these guys. I just got the list up through B here, so i uh, just give you an idea of the number of people that are being reported on that are actually working on different uh, free energy technologies. Uh, free energy uh, contemporaries, there's a whole list there, starting with um, De Palma, I haven't listed them all, I'll just to give you an idea. T. Townsend Brown with his electronic uh, motor and, and gravitics, uh, which by the way, uh, in uh, when, uh, when I read that book about uh, gravity propulsion, uh, in there, he talks about uh, T. Townsend Brown, and he claims in talking to people who have been in the black programs that that technology is actually on the B-2 bomber. Uh, when they get it up to altitude, they convert over to the uh, static discharge as a way of propulsing, propelling uh, that, uh, that plane. Uh, Yule Brown is responsible for Brown's gas, and a lot of people are experimenting with Brown's gas, which is a, a form of, of water uh, or hydrogen and oxygen that comes from water that is not an O2 and an H2, but it's a, it's a combination of the two together that doesn't burn until you put enough energy to it. And, it, and it, when it burns, it burns implosively and then expands with the heat. And it has some very interesting uh, characteristics, as uh, many of you know. Andrea Rossi, uh, He's got a low energy nuclear reaction generator uh, over in over in uh, Europe, and uh, my understanding that has been validated. He's got a one megawatt uh, machine that he's going to be bringing to the United States in the very near future, uh, try to try out over here, demonstrate over here, and that one is over Unity. 
there's a whole wide range of technologies uh, from which uh, free energies can be obtained. And I've just listed out some of the uh, very limited uh, number of uh, low energy or technologies you get free energy from. And I've uh, bolded those that I think are kind of in the forefront of the free energy technology at this point in time. Uh, hydrogen browns gas, uh, where you, you get the hydrogen out and uh, use it to burn in, in motors. Um, motor generators are, are very prevalent uh, in the experimentation stage now. And uh, I haven't personally uh, witnessed any of those, but uh, seen a lot on YouTube. Um, nuclear cold fusion. Uh, I, I, was, uh, I actually got to see a, a talk by uh, Pons and Fleischmann uh, when they first introduced the cold fusion. And then they were driven out of the country. Uh, Japan really picked up on the, uh, on the research on that. And uh, I'm doing a lot of good work over there in, in Japan and in nuclear cold fusion. Uh, there's a whole wide range of uh, cold fusion work in, in, the, in that area because it's based in kind of on electrolysis. And now we've gotten into, you, you heard the uh, talk by uh, Maury King uh, talking about cavitation. And I actually did some experimentation with electrolysis using stainless steel and some uh, pure water and actually got some transmutation in that, uh, that cell ba uh, based on uh, reports by a uh, metallurgist that I worked with. Uh, so this is real stuff uh, and just needs money, needs research uh, to get it into practical devices. Uh, there's a uh, there's a lot of solid state technologies are demonstrating uh, violations of, this, of the second law of thermodynamics. Um, kinetic energy devices, plasma devices, uh, crystal energy, electromagnetics, and I mentioned electrolysis vortex technologies. Uh, vortex seems to be a key in a, a lot of these different uh, free energy uh, uh, technology when you start looking into uh, the ether based. Uh, technologies. I, I like the, the theories of Nassim Harman uh, and his black hole theories and the toroidal theories and going from the atom up to the universe. Everything should work the same. Uh, that, that is my theory. I'll give a couple of examples of uh, as part of the New Energy System Trust. We are sponsoring a couple of uh, uh, individuals and their, and their research at this point in time because of their, we feel they're real, really valid uh, technologies that need funding. Uh, one is uh, Edward Mitchell with True Green Solutions is working on a, uh, a replication of Stanley Myers technology. And Stan, Stanley Myers technology is not the usual HHO because what he's doing is he's, he's put using voltage and frequency to really just dissociate the hydrogen, the water molecule into hydrogen and oxygen, and and then you can burn it from that point of time. And he has demonstrated uh, in his car supposedly uh, a on-demand ability to provide enough hydrogen to run his car. And then he didn't have enough safety devices in the first time, so he, it uh, he had an accident. Now he's on his second series of prototypes, uh, and he's he had this one working at the conference and and. Uh, but he had the wrong resistor in there or something, and uh, he lost it the uh, first time. So he's got a little more work to do. Uh, it's, it's, uh, and it can be used on other gases, other fuels, uh, so not just water. Uh, and so he talks about actually using uh, is a gas exciter in the intake manifold to to take out, out the pollutants and, and dissociate the, the particles coming in. And you can do that on the output also. Uh, so there's a, a picture of his devices uh, that he has here at the, the conference, at least the one on the right. The other one's his old, uh, old version of that uh, water fuel capacitor, as he calls it. Uh, and then we, uh, I am uh, representing a booth by uh, Electron Power Systems uh, Clean Fusion Energy, uh, Clint Seward, uh, he, he's a, what I call a professional's professional. He was uh, uh, in uh, one, of the, one of the major uh, corporations back east, and he was in the military, 
he was a manager. When he retired, he decided, I want to do something unique. And he settled in on ball lightning. He said, nobody is studying ball lightning. So he decided to uh, study ball lightning and uh, build his own little laboratory and start experimenting with it. Well, he, he finally got to the point where in, in researching, and he realized that uh, lightning is created from the ionosphere down to the earth, and it's, it's a little less than atmospheric pressure up there at the ionosphere. So he, in his bell jar, he reduced from atmosphere down to a, a lower pressure, and he started to get some, uh, some results. One day his wife uh, was in there, and, and, he, and he said, well, I'm just not getting anything out of this. And she says, well, what are these little tiny things floating around at the bottom? And so they amplified these little floaters that were down at the bottom when he turned off the electricity. And sure enough, there were little toroids. Uh, so he finally figured out how to create a, a toroid. And uh, there's an example of a toroid. That's a, actually a 15 centimeter. His first ones were very small. But you got these 15 centimeter uh, toroids, uh, which are, uh, he, can, he can control them, move them back and forth. Uh, he can keep them, keep them going indefinitely. So he, once he creates a toroid, it, it con continues to exist. So he's at this point where he can put, he wants to create two toroids in the same chamber and then collide them. So whatever gases that you're using in there, uh, whatever ions are in that toroid, it, you can just collide them with two toroids and then you have a fusion process. So his... Uh, his theory is that he can create a home generator with a fusion process using a hydrogen boron uh, process, which is does, supposedly lacks radiation and neutrons that come off your typical fusion process. So this looks, this really looks uh, very promising at this this point in time. And that's a picture of his laboratory. Uh, the uh, that's his bell jar in the background back there, and, and uh, it doesn't show his uh, power power rack, but then there's his uh, computer control system there. So a real laboratory and a real live scientist. He's By the way, he has a, a model for those toroids, uh, and he's been working with an MIT uh, doctor uh, who believes in his uh, his work and uh, has been working on the, on that uh, mathematical one. So far, all of his results have followed, have followed that mathematical model. So what are, the, what are the obstacles of uh, getting free energy out there? Well, there's a lot of vested interest in not wanting free energy to get out there, and a lot of that has to do with money and, and power. Uh, the government has its own black programs. Uh, in, in the book by uh, Paul LaViolette, uh, Anti-Gravity Propulsion, uh, he says that they have that science already, they have it written down. They have the science of free energy technologies all written down. They have their own flying saucer fleet. Uh, so there's a, all that money in those black programs are going into that and they're just keeping it from us. Oil industry, of course, is invested in their, uh, uh, the money they make off, off of all of the oil that they extract from the earth, which I don't think is good over the long term. Uh, besides the pollutant that you create in burning the, the, the stuff. And then the automobile industries which use the oil are, are tied together with the oil industry, so they don't want to uh, change the efficiency of your engines or, or replace the type of engines you use. Even if you go to electric cars, you've got to burn fuel to generate the electricity someplace. So it's just all tied together. Um, and then there's the, what I call the, the mainstream good old boy science club, uh, that uh, you know just sticks to their traditional science and doesn't want to venture out, uh, and it and it comes in the, the in the universities. It comes in the in the journals. The people that are in control of all the the journals that uh, where you write your articles. And some people may get actually get some advanced research and get into those journals. But then when they figure out that they're violating the second law of thermodynamics, then it's cut off. <laughs> Or if it's, if it's going to create a device that is going to substitute for oil, it gets shut off. It, it just happens over and over. Well, what, what would be the advantage of uh, getting the free energy besides replacing nuclear power plants? Tremendous amount of freedom uh, in this country and 
freeing up of our, our uh, wealth for the individual um, travel. Uh, if you could use anti-gravity uh, devices, you have fuelless and, and free energy cars, you have fuelless cars, electric cars, uh, uh, you know, use water for your, for your power, have anti-gravity, and, and if you get to anti-gravity devices, we can, we can start uh, moving out of the big cities and move into the country, and then you use anti-gravity propulsion. You create small communities, and you, and you can commute with these anti-gravity cars from one place to another, uh, so simply without roads, and, and uh, just so much freedom. And you get out there, and, and you have your own your free energy uh, power devices out there. You don't have to rely on a grid. You spread our civilization out, have these small communities, and you have maybe communities where you have, uh, it's industrialized, and so that's where you go to work. Uh, and so, it, you know, it's just a whole, new, and with a whole change in the economy, no more uh, taxes on the, on the grid, and uh, much cheaper fuel costs because you're, you're generating it on your own. So how do we go about uh, getting this free energy society uh, going? Well, I think we have, to, we have to start, of course, uh, uh, organizing and uh, educating the public. Uh, we need to go into our legislatures and educating our legislative people who are local elected officials, not the uh, professional uh, political people. That are that are uh, back there, uh, and we have to continue these free energy conferences, expand on them, and maybe uh, specialize in the type of conferences you have. Uh, the technical guys really love to get together and talk about the technologies. Uh, we were talking uh, to uh, uh, Catherine. Uh, Bits uh, the other day, and uh, she said, "It's not about the technology. People don't care about the technology. The you know, the normal person on, on the street you don't care about the technology. You just solve a problem. But if you can solve his problem with free energy technology, uh, then he's going to be very happy. He didn't care whether he has to pay for it or not pay for it, uh, but it solved his problem. So that's the way we have to go." Uh, we have to establish new funding sources. Anybody for an ice cream? <laughs> Can you wait just, just a minute? <laughs> uh, and then we have to, uh, uh, I, I'm involved in an uh, energy incubator. Major universities have incubators where they, uh, they bring technology from the university out in, into the market uh, and they create funding for that and help them along the way. That's what we need to do with uh, free energy development free energy incubators and link up with uh, some funding. So let's, let's get with it. Let's organize. Let's uh, embrace free energy technologies and, and bring it into the world. Uh, the new paradigm has got to be free energy and breakthrough energies sands the grid. Uh, and we can transition to this new paradigm with renewable energies at this point in time and even combine free energy technologies energy application technologies with new energy uh, technologies uh, to do that. Science and engineering must get beyond the square root of minus one. The square root of minus one is an imaginary one I in mathematics, and there is a mathematics beyond that uh, that most engineers have thrown it away because it in, in our 3D system, it isn't needed. But now we're, when we get to learn about free energy, we're starting to find that in the ether, uh, in order to understand that, we've got to get into the, uh, that mathematics is beyond the square root of minus, minus one. Uh, we have to embrace the new quantum physics, the multiple dimensions of space-time physics, uh, and create a whole new ether science to understand this free energy and bring it into the world. Thank you. And, and I will answer a couple of quick questions uh, right now. If, uh, yes? You mentioned the, uh, the 
Uh, we need to we need to get a, get you a microphone. I think. Classic Science Foundation. Question: You mentioned a writer. I thought I heard Violet or something like Paul that. Paul LaViolette. Paul LaViolette. You can you can find that book and actually in the physics section of uh, Barnes and Noble. Believe it or not. Anti-gravity propulsion. Uh, I have an email list, and uh, if you've written anything, I'd like to send it out on the email list. I've got about eight people on it devoting exotic clean energy. Have you written any books or essays you can read? It's uh, a little hard to absorb all that you know, as you go from one, one picture. The, the one that I'm reading now is, is, is excellent for a, a basis of it, and that Infinite Energy Technologies and uh, Ebersole is the uh, editor on that book. Would be a good book to take a look at. Anybody else? I must have did a great talk. <laughs> Thank you.